This morning's uh, opening scripture starts off in Hebrews 4. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Pentecost Sunday, and this is an exciting day, which marks exactly 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It was on this day that God fulfilled the promise of Jesus that a tremendous gift was coming to the believers. So let's read about this in the book of Acts. If you want to turn there, we'll be reading from Acts 1, starting right at verse 1. So Dr. Luke wrote two books of our New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and Acts. He wrote these two books to someone named Theophilus. We don't exactly know who he was, but with a Greco-Roman name like that, he was probably some distinguished person in Roman society that was acquainted with Luke. And he wanted to understand matters around Jesus and these people who were followers of him. So we'll start right from the beginning, Acts 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you can skip down now to chapter 2, and we'll keep reading about the coming of this gift. Acts 2. This is from the New Living Translation. The Holy Spirit comes. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, Ah, they're just drunk, that's all. Peter preaches to the crowd. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. And with that opening line, Peter p- launched into a sermon that explained how this was predicted by the prophets and was fulfilled in Jesus. Dr. Luke goes on in his second book to describe how this gift of the Holy Spirit 
spread beyond the 120 in that upper room, spread even to the Gentiles. And that's when the controversy began. Turn further, if you will, to Acts chapter 15. Acts 15, and this will be read from the message translation. It wasn't long before some Jews showed up from Judea insisting that everyone be circumcised. If you're not circumcised in the Mosaic fashion, you can't be saved. Paul and Barnabas were on their feet at once in fierce protest. The church decided to resolve the matter by sending Paul, Barnabas, and a few others to put it before the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. Now, if you can skip down to verse 6. The apostles and leaders called a special meeting to consider the matter. The arguments went on and on, back and forth, getting more and more heated. Then Peter took the floor. Friends, you well know that from early on, God made it quite plain that he wanted the pagans to hear the message of this good news and embrace it, and not in any second-hand or roundabout way, but first-hand, straight from my mouth. And God, who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit exactly as he gave him to us. He treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were and working from that center and outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed in him. So why are you now trying to out-God God? Loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too. Don't we believe that we are saved because the Master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity moved to save us just as he did those from beyond our nation? So what are we arguing about? There was dead silence. No one said a word. Well, this was one tense meeting, hey? Wouldn't you have liked to have been a part of that one? The church was at an important crossroads of trying to understand what the giving of the Holy Spirit to Gentiles meant and how they were to proceed as a church. Then the brother of Jesus, James, who was known to be a very conservative Jew, stood up and brought things to a conclusion. If you can skip down now to verse 19, and we'll finish. So here is my decision. We're not going to unnecessarily burden non-Jewish people who turn to the master. We'll write them a letter and tell them, be careful to not get involved in activities connected with idols, to guard the morality of sex and marriage, to not serve food offensive to Jewish Christians, blood, for instance, this is basic wisdom from Moses, preached and honored for centuries now in city after city as, they, as we have met and kept the Sabbath. Everyone agreed, apostles, leaders, all the people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we have been in a series of messages, starting with uh, Easter, where we looked at the gospel accounts of the resurrection. And we've been talking about the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And you know, it's wonderful when God steps into history and does things, but it usually brings up other questions. Well, what does that mean? Or what do we do from here? And that's exactly what we heard about this morning in our scripture reading. It was wonderful that God gave the Holy Spirit and then sent them with all these different languages through the whole world. Gentiles, by the droves, came to faith in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? But then the questions arose. Okay, but how, how do we go from here now? What about all the Jewish laws that should be kept? And that's why they had to have that big meeting in Acts chapter 15. 
the apostles and the elders and the leaders all met to discuss this very practical question. It's great having all these Gentiles come in, but what about their lifestyle? What about all that we have been keeping so faithfully all these years? And uh, all these questions ended up in a big debate, and then they concluded, and they wrote up a statement. And they sent that letter with the statement to all the churches saying, here's what we have concluded. Now, the apostles had tremendous authority to settle these questions because they were the people who were actually with Jesus. They were with him. They heard all his teaching. They saw what he did. They, they listened and they had questions back and forth. So when it came to any time that there was a question in the church, they would simply turn, look to the apostles and say, well, what do you think? What should we do? And they had that authority. Well, they did decide, they wrote it down, and that became the guide for the church. Now, when you write down something in summary form that has importance to it, we call it a creed. Now, that word creed actually comes from the Latin. The Latin word credo means I believe. So when we say that we have a creed, we're talking about a set of beliefs or aims that guides someone's actions. Now, having a set of beliefs is not new to Christian faith. In fact, it was there in the Bible all along. And we hear about this whenever you go to a Jewish synagogue. You will hear them state their creed. Now, I'm going to actually uh, introduce you to this rabbi here. His name is Jonathan Sachs. He's probably uh, the most respected, one of the most respected rabbis in the world. He is the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations in the Commonwealth uh, up till just 2013. He's uh, alive and well and has put uh, videos on, on the web. So I'm going to play you a very short clip, and I want you to listen to this rabbi talk about the most important phrase in the Old Testament. I want you to watch the video, video carefully. You're going to see the Hebrew script on the left of the screen, but watch as the camera pans to the English on the right side of the screen at the top right-hand corner. Watch what you see there. Let's see it. Jews are the people of the book. Talmud Torah, studying Torah, is the greatest of all the commands and the secret of Jewish continuity. In the Shema, we are commanded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your might. Then, almost immediately, it says, teach these things repeatedly to your children, speaking of them when you sit at home and when you travel on the way, when you lie down and when you rise. So, oh, did you see what you saw on the English side of that? The script changed when it came to this core phrase. It's called the Shema Israel. That is Hebrew for this very first opening phrase, Hear, O Israel. That's what Shema Israel means in Hebrew. This is the phrase that is repeated by Jewish congregations every time they get together. It is their creed. They say this aloud together as a way to memorize and cement this into their hearts and their minds. So, I'm going to invite you to do this. Let's say this Shema Israel in English together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Foundational truth. Now, this setting up of the creed, this core statement, was a pattern that the early church had been doing all along. And they too then came to the point where they began to define their beliefs about Jesus in some kind of a summary statement. And we see the summary statement about Jesus emerging in the writings of Paul in the New Testament. Now, there are several statements in the New Testament that sound like these special summary statements of belief. 
And you'll notice when you're reading your New Testament that the writing style changes when it hits these compact statements. It sounds a bit more like poetry. And poetry that's put to music is called a song. And today I'll show you one of the New Testament creeds, poetry sections, perhaps the most obvious one that's in the New Testament. We've identi we identified a number of them, but I'm going to turn and have you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, this is an example of Paul. He's the one that's writing these letters here. He's writing this letter to a young man named Timothy. Now, Timothy was a young pastor who was just starting out, and Paul wrote this letter to him to explain to him how to lead the church. And in chapter 3, in verse 14, he said, I hope to come to you soon, and I'm writing these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And then in his letter, <clears throat> he breaks into the summary statement of Christian faith, this, this divine mystery that brings godliness to people who fully believe it. And you'll notice how the cadence changes. How about we all read the poem together? He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Here's a summary statement. This is something that we believe. It's a credo, Latin for, I believe. And so we have the beginnings of these compact statements that show up in Paul's writings. Now, this factor of having an authority to be able to ask questions worked fine until all the apostles died. And then the church entered into a new era that they were not actually entirely prepared for. There were new questions that came up. And they couldn't just turn to the apostles and say, well, what do we think? They actually had to confer together. They had to talk about this. They had to discuss, how does this work with God? How does it work in this new situation? And that, folks is when theology began. Theology is two words. Theos, meaning God, and logos, meaning word. So we're talking about the study of God and God's relation to the world. And they would meet together and discuss, what does it mean? What do we do to this question that has arisen? And questions were arising in the church. They were spurred by the opposition that was coming against the church. There was intense persecution that came from the Jewish people who didn't believe and from the Romans who were threatened by this new religion. The Romans wanted everybody to worship their gods. And they felt that religion would be the unifying principle in the Roman Empire. And so they required everybody to bow the knee and say, Caesar is Lord. And these Jewish Christians wouldn't do it. And so there was opposition that came against them. Now, some of the questions came from the outside, criticisms by Roman people and by Greek philosophers who couldn't understand this thing about Messiah and crucifixion and resurrection. They were just like, no, they didn't agree. They couldn't make sense of it. But there were also questions that were beginning to arise from within the, con within the, the Jewish people as this gospel spread and went to all these different countries, and all these Gentiles came in, they kind of brought some of their Gentile ideas with them. And there arose some false ideas about Jesus. And there came a real time, a time of real concern as the early church was trying to keep the understanding clear as to what do we actually believe in response now to all this that's been happening. And we enter into this very important phase of the church, which we call the early church. Now, I've been helped with uh, the study on this by a couple of books that are leading me through this, and I'm anticipating here doing a series on the Apostles' Creed. Because 
what we find is that be, the early Christians who had no apostles to turn to and ask, they instead turned to other authorities that were in the church. And so here's an early painting of some of the church fathers, and you can see they are wearing uh, symbols of the cross, they, they are official people, and they're holding this document. So this is the leaders of the church, the bishops and the different ones that were made uh, the official leaders of the church, and they met together and they hold this document. This is a creed. This is a summary statement of what we believe in light of everything that's going on. And they met in a series of councils because they remembered, oh yeah, back when we had that first question and we weren't sure about what to do with all these Gentiles, we had a big meeting in Jerusalem and everybody came together and we had a big meeting and we wrote it all out. So they did that again. And they would meet at special gathering times, bringing these leaders from all over the Christian world, bring them to this place, and they would hammer out and debate and come up with a written document. You know, this is important, actually, because we as the church today in Canada are living in times a little bit like the early church. There are diverse populations that are mixing in the world like never before. We have people moving into Europe by the droves with Islam as their primary way of thinking. We have many coming to this country. We have all kinds of religions in Canada now. And there's all kinds of ideas that are floating around. And there's an increasing antagonistic attitude by the governing authorities against Christian belief. And so there can come creeping into the church different ways of responding to all this pressure. Okay, how can we accommodate that idea? How can we make sense of this that's being put toward us? And there can come this opposition that's especially coming through what we call postmodern thinking, where they say there is no truth. It's just your truth and my truth. Wow, those are fundamental challenges to Christian faith, folks. And we need a clear foundation to hold us. And I'm thinking especially of some young people in this congregation who perhaps are headed to university. You go to university and you're going to meet people who are fundamentally opposed to everything that we believe here. And they will use very strong logic and language and ideas to try and dismantle the faith of those who have been born into Christian families. And when we have that kind of opposition coming, not just for young people, but even within the wider culture, we need to get clear about what are the fundamental aspects of faith. We need to be grounded so that we're not blown around by every current cultural wind of idea that happens to come. And the foundational ideas need to be short enough that we can actually memorize them and that we can keep them as like a core of foundation stones to our faith. And the church did this actually. In the first couple hundred years, they met and they came up with this core statement that was actually has been a, uh, believed by the church all over the world through 2,000 years. And they called it the Apostles' Creed. This is a summary statement of what the apostles believed. And they put it into this document that helped the church get clear as to okay, what, what are the core and clear and most important elements that we have to have as part of what the apostles would have said. They were here. Now, there was another creed that also was done when they met in another place called Nicaea. It's called the Nicaean Creed. I'll talk about that one a little bit later in this series. But the Apostles' Creed was the earlier one and the most fundamental. It's a summary statement that the church memorized together. So here's a modern picture of what this creed looked like. So what I'm going to actually invite you to do <clears throat> is... In a minute here, we're going to have you stand, and we're going to say this creed together. This is what we would call our confession of faith. This is our summary statement of what we mean when we say we believe. Now, I want to point out a couple things. I've called this series, We Believe. But notice it says, 
I believe. I believe in God. This is a personal statement for each one who is a believer. It's not a general statement that we would say, oh, you know, the church believes that. No, the apostles said this is something that you individually need to believe. If you want to be a faith in Christ, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, here's the fundamentals. When we all say it together, we agree together, we can say, well, we believe. But fundamentally, folks, what do you believe? Well, here's a guide. Here's a foundation stone that can be said this way. You'll notice that that phrase, I believe, shows up twice. It's really important. There's another word that I want to explain here, and this is phrase, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, Catholic is a small c, and it means general. This is not the Roman Catholic Church, okay? That's a denomination or a grouping. The, this is talking about the holy general church. And by general, we mean all over the globe. There's a whole eastern church that most of us are not even aware of. They are part of this holy Catholic belief. They too come to this Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and have that as their fundamentals. So when we talk about believing in this general church, that's what that phrase means. Now I also want you to know, notice how central Jesus Christ is. This whole section here is about Jesus. Very interesting. We'll get into that a little bit later. So, would you stand as a congregation? And I'm going to invite you to repeat this. Now, I, I, I don't want to put undue pressure on anybody who may be thinking in your heart, well, I'm not sure about all this. So I'm not going to force you to say something. If you are, are just wanting to observe and you want to just kind of see, you can just stand there and see what we think. And then as we go through the creed, maybe it'll become clearer to you. But let's, those of you who would like to affirm this as faith, let's say this Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. So if someone asks you, well, what, do you what do you believe? What's, what do you believe as a, as a Christian? What's, what's, what is it about you? What do you believe? Here's what you can tell. If you have this memorized, you can give a good answer to someone. And when you explain this in ordinary language, that will be a fundamental, balanced, biblical answer as to what you actually believe. And we're going to actually take a look at that, some of these pieces in the, the coming messages. And you'll notice that a lot of this has to do, especially the center section, from the suffering, Pontius Pilate, there's a lot of detail that go around the suffering and the cross, the dying, and the coming to life. And that, folks, is because that is central to the Christian message. And there's parts of this that are more difficult, of course. And it would be tempting to kind of skip over the difficult things about our faith, like the torture of Christ, crucifixion, violent death, blood, grave. Like these are not pleasant subjects. 
And we might be tempted to skip over this in our saying, well, as a Christian, here's what we believe. But actually, the Apostles' Creed helps us keep everything together. The Gospels spend quite a bit of time talking about that last week, and there's a reason why. We'll look into that as we come through the series. But you'll notice that Jesus himself pointed to this, and he invited the disciples to a special meal. It was the night before he was going to be betrayed, before the suffering would begin, before this terrible, terrible experience would happen. He called them together, and he said, I want you to remember something, and I want you to repeat this so you don't forget it. And he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, my body is about to be broken. And there's a reason for it. It's for you. And my blood will be spilt. And there's a reason why it has to happen. Now, the disciples did not understand it in the moment. And we have been trying to understand it ever since. And it is a profound subject that will take you a lifetime to even begin to get. But there is a centrality to this Suffering and death, broken body and spilled blood, and then resurrection. This, folks, is the core, the most important element of Christian faith. And so ever since that first time when Jesus did it, the church has been remembering with these emblems. Now, this is what Jesus meant when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That was not understood by people at the time. But looking back now, when we see the symbolic meal, the eating of the broken body, the drinking of his sacrificial blood, we begin to get an understanding that there's something about this crucifixion, this death, this resurrection that brings life to those who partake. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us life. We are stunned that you are willing to do this for us. We are aghast at the price that it was for you to make this possible. So with gratefulness, we participate this morning and thank you from the bottom of our heart. Amen. Let's receive our benediction. The scripture tells us, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. Do you believe? Say, I believe. I believe. We have this faith. We can hold firmly.